Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the financial intelligence sharing on the GDPR hosted by Duality. I'm really excited to have everybody here. Um, in a minute, our panelists will discuss how we're using privacy enhancing technologies, financial institutions can balance conflicting compliance requirements. They will also share real case studies on how this is being done today. As you watch today's webinar, we encourage you to send any questions or comments you might have to info at duality.com. With that, I'd like to hand over to Nick Maxwell, our moderator. Nick is the head of, of the Future of Financial Intelligence Sharing Research Program within the RUSI Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. Nick leads research into the role of public-private uh, financial intelligence sharing to detect, prevent, and disrupt financial crime. Nick, please take it from here. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you to uh, Duality Technologies for organizing uh, this webinar. I'm delighted to be moderating the discussion. I think we have a fantastic set of panelists who are going to talk us through some of uh, you know, what, what seem to us to be uh, some of the most exciting uh, projects using uh, privacy enhancing technology, privacy preserving analysis to really support greater uh, information sharing capabilities while still protecting privacy and preserving privacy uh, in, in, in that process, but really to support more effective outcomes to discover financial crime and to act uh, on, on that detection. Um, so uh, we've, we've got a fantastic panel um, uh, with a number of different projects that are using the technologies uh, in, in different ways to support information sharing. Uh, what I'd like to do is to spend five minutes um, for each uh, technologist uh, or project owner um, to talk through their project and just give us a brief explanation for, for, for what the project uh, involves. Um, and then Odia Kagan um, uh, from Fox Rothschilds uh, will be uh, kind of stepping back and, and thinking about um, what the GDPR key questions are, key challenges are, um, things for policymakers to be thinking about, as well as supervisors, uh, as well as practitioners uh, in the future. Um, but to kick us off, I'm going to hand over to Anthony Tarr from Societe uh, Generale, uh, who's been leading a, uh, a very interesting project, Project Danny. Um, Anthony, can you talk us through um, Project Danny? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Anthony Ta. I'm Digital Project Director, Innovation and Watch Leader for Société General Wholesale. And as Nick mentioned, I'm part of uh, the Dani uh, Initiative. So maybe I can introduce uh, in a nutshell what uh, Dani is. So Société General is part of a consortium of banks and data providers. Our focus is on the data quality based on peers collaborating with one another. And because of none of us wants to disclose any data to our peers and competitors, we use the latest privacy enhancing technologies. So this will allow us to collaborate in a fully anonymous way, keep all our data private encrypted at all times, measure the quality of our data, avoid costly th trusted third party to centralize uh, the data and reduce the internal maintenance cost uh, and operational cost as well. So we're cur currently uh, reconciling clients reference data and we use uh, a matching key called the LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier, and participants can attach that attributes linked to this LEI, such as the full legal name, the big code, the MR classification, the NACE code. So from the reconciliation, we get the consensus report on each data attribute linked to this LEI. So let's see how it works. So in each participant needs to extract their data from their database, and the platform comes with a data and uh, format verification tool that we will all use to verify our data. Data is then encrypted locally on our machine before being uploaded to the remote Danny reconciliation service. All these steps are made easy with a web interface. Participants are anonymized, of course, and all data remains encrypted at all times. So depending on how large your data set is, it takes from seconds to a few minutes to get a report showing if you are in a full consensus with your peers and where you have anomalies. So we've done already two proof of concept in 2020, one in January and one in June. And overall feedback from participants is very positive. And we managed to process over 200,000 of LEI on more than 30 data fields, which with three banks and three data providers on the second floor. The technical solution is provided by a London-based startup called Secretarium, 
which used a privacy enhancing technology called confidential computing. There was a virtual summit organized in November last year at which around 17 financial institutions did participate. The aim was to introduce Danny to a wider community of financial institutions and to onboard them in this consortium. We expect to have the commitment of these new banks uh, I mean, these coming months, and we have defined the 2021 roadmap and plan to expand into uh, other database to focus on the KYC AML, as well as a new AML CTR service and potentially market data one. Thank you very much, Anthony. And, uh, and that's a, a UK based uh, project so far, is that correct? Say, correct, yeah. Fantastic. So multiple financial institutions collaborating to enhance their understanding of client reference data um, and, and really interesting to, to get that uh, summary of the data uh, exchange so far through the pilot. Uh, moving from that UK uh, project uh, to the Netherlands, uh, Hilko van Rooyen uh, from Deloitte, uh, uh, who has been um, a key figure behind the scenes uh, in developing the technology and thinking about the various project uh, aspects to transaction monitoring NL, uh, a really exciting multi-institutional transaction uh, monitoring project. Um, Hilko, can you talk us through this project and, and, and where you've got to now? Sure, yeah. So uh, first introduction of myself, I'm Hilko uh, van Rooij, uh, Director at Deloitte uh, Forensic in uh, the Netherlands, and working indeed from a tech and data science uh, background. So transaction monitor in the Netherlands, we're a team in house an initiative of the five largest uh, banks in our country to build a transaction monitoring utility. And the purpose of that is to enhance the outcome effectiveness of, of AML monitoring currently applied by collaboration, by, by data sharing. And the utility or ATM utility is a concept or be developed or being looked at in, in, in multiple uh, jurisdictions. I think in the Netherlands, we're somewhat ahead of that curve and we're really building one in the end game, uh, such a utility can take over certain parts of the uh, financial uh, crime monitoring that is currently performed by financial institutions and more. So in order to achieve that, data has to be, uh, be shared. And in the NL use case of the utility, that also comprises uh, transactional data. In our country, in the Netherlands, uh, legislation, uh, AML legislation is on its way to provide explicit legal grounds and guidance for that uh, data uh, sharing, also specifically for that uh, purpose of uh, TMNL and in this form. Um, but anticipating that, TMNL is already uh, proceeding uh, forward. And regarding exact uh, regulatory changes we will uh, see, uh, multiple measures are taken to guarantee regulatory compliance, as well as responsible use of, uh, of data. And a, a due process according to GDPR is, of course, uh, being followed uh, in that. And among other measures, uh, in the current phase, at least in the first phase, an advanced execution uh, scheme is being applied that uh, pseudonymizes the raw data to unrecognizable values, um, but in such a way that it can still be meaningfully combined uh, centers. We also watch uh, other techniques uh, following uh, that uh, closely, so it might change uh, any time in the future also. Thank you, Hilko. And, uh, you know, really interesting. Uh, obviously, you've been able to do proofs of concepts uh, and, and working, as I understand, on, on company data somewhat outside of uh, the GDPR um, uh, remit, um, but uh, waiting for that uh, empowering legislation to come through from, from the Netherlands Parliament to be able to work on personal data, which would bring the exercise within GDPR. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Great. Uh, well, I think that, that that would be really interesting and perhaps Odia, you know, might be able to reflect on, um, you know, that balance between what can be done with company data um, and potentially, uh, you know, the, the, the line at, at which it, it goes into being covered by um, uh, GDPR. Um, over to Ronan. Uh, Ronan Cohen, uh, Head of Product uh, Marketing and Product Strategy at Duality Technologies to talk us through the Duality Technology um, project for this panel. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so the, the project I'll share was actually covered by uh, you uh, in one of your earlier white papers, as well as in a write-up by uh, the World Economic Forum uh, pretty recently. Uh, so we actually worked with an organization called the Cyber Defense Alliance, which is a consortium of EU and UK-based banks and law enforcement agencies on a privacy-preserving information-sharing system designed to help uh, advance fraud and cybercrime investigations. 
we deployed a technology called homomorphic encryption to facilitate that secure and private information sharing. Uh, so for anyone that's not familiar with homomorphic encryption, uh, you could basically think of it as encryption in use. So it allows you to encrypt data, but still compute on it without having to decrypt it. And this is basically what helps you protect privacy and confidentiality. So in this specific project, participants used homomorphic encryption to engage in collaborative cross-institution or cross-organizational investigations, uh, basically to help them drive quality and efficiency. And the way they were using uh, the homomorphic encryption technology was in exchanging encrypted queries. So they were basically uh, sending really sensitive questions um, and answers to those questions while preserving privacy. And so they were able to um, ask questions around things like uh, account ownership, uh, account balances and flow of funds, uh, relationships between different entities and so on without revealing the subjects of the investigations. So they were able to automatically receive answers to those questions in under a minute and use the capability to uncover things like fraud rings. Um, in terms of GDPR specifically, uh, the fact that homomorphic encryption was used uh, meant that the participants had a privacy preserving analytical capability at their fingertips. So they were basically able to negate the risks of disclosure and regulatory breaches while still conducting the analyses and the investigations that they needed to conduct. Uh, so in other words, the value that homomorphic encryption brings to GDPR and to other privacy laws in general is that it helps balance the need to keep data private and secure with the need to use it, collaborate on it with others, extract value from it, um, and basically balance those competing priorities. I think, you know, similarly to what uh, Hilco and, and Anthony described for their projects as well. Fantastic. So, you know, quite, quite a, a wide range of, of, of use cases. You know, we've got situations where multiple banks are trying to test their, uh, uh, their um, consensus uh, of client reference data with, with peers without revealing um, data about their individual clients, but getting a consensus report if there is a, a variance in some client reference data among their peers. We have a transaction monitoring NL uh, utility, um, which before it really gets into personal data is waiting for enabling legislation in the Netherlands, but is set up um, to, to handle uh, 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 encrypted analysis of uh, the, the flow of transactions across multiple uh, financial institutions. And we have um, from Ronan uh, a description of how um, secure privacy um, uh, preserving queries can be made um, where otherwise there might be uh, concerns about uh, tipping off uh, or revealing um, the nature uh, and, and the uh, personal details of, a, of, a, of an account which is being subject to investigation, but being able to draw information without disclosing that query. Um, Stepping back from all of that, um, Odia, what's your view about this field you know, as a whole? Uh, we have a lot of um, incentives uh, or, or need uh, within AML uh, processes to share information, to get a better understanding of risk, to make better decisions for AML, but obviously within GDPR, um, uh, a framework which is uh, you know, very strong in its protection of uh, privacy and personal data. You know, what value do you see privacy preserving technologies having? How do they interact with, uh, with GDPR? Um, and what questions and challenges do you see um, for, for all types of practitioners, um, uh, including policymakers and supervisors, uh, thinking about how projects like these connect with GDPR? Right, so thank you. So first of all, let's take a step back and, 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 and talk about the underlying problem, right? The underlying problem is that financial institutions and banks um, want to share information uh, as much as possible in order to make the ability, in order for their ability to detect fraud and detect bad actors be more efficient. And um, you know, industry experts argue that it's even impossible for a one bank to do it from their own like information, right? So then, and there's, as, as, as you said, right? There's also the incentive, there's also the AML directive, which says, hey guys, you know, help us do this. Um, on the other hand, GDPR uh, basically puts limitations on the collection and the sharing of the information. And the limitations are 
uh, in their conceptual, right? So you need to collect only as much as you need. You need to share only as necessary. Um, if it's anonymized, it falls out of scope. But none of these, and you can share without consent if you have legitimate interest. Now, you know, being the only, you, you guys are well versed in this, but I am sure that a lot of people listening are like, what's legitimate interest, what's necessary, and what's anonymous? And also, I say that because we don't really have good, clear definitions of these concepts. And in the absence of a good, clear definition, then you have a a clash, right? And this has been recognized, right? There was a consultation in the UK done on the transposition of 5 MLD. And they say, the government recognizes that there remains a wide range of views on the nature and extent of data sharing with those who have a legitimate interest, balancing the right to privacy against the need for greater transparency as a means of detecting and deterring financial crime. Okay. So we all know that there's a problem, okay? And, and the problem is this. Um, number one, um, when you collect and share information, even in cases where, um, you know, you have queries that one institution pings another, but neither of them kind of really know what the question or the answer was, the question still get, got asked, the answer still got given and those pinpointed allegedly a person, right? And the pinpointing of a person and in, in GDPR, it, even in other contexts, right? That does not automatically absolve this from being processing of personal data, right? In other cases with other um, PETs, right? Maybe you do have information which is anonymized, but then the question is it really, is it anonymized or is it really anonymized? And the difficulty being that GDPR does not, uh, the concept is not clear enough for this type of implementation, right? Um, it needs to be something where the person is not identifiable and identifiable under GDPR has been defined as a way that even relies on third parties and has a few stages and is very broad. If you actually even do this across the pond, here in the US, we now have CCPA, we have other problems. CCPA has the concept of de-identify. The concept of de-identify is also equally you know, um, vague, right? Reasonably linked or linkable to a person or a device, great. And also imposes other obligations on various participants in the chain to have internal policies and procedures prohibiting re-identification to impose contractually downstream this. So now you're also talking about when, let's say you have a number of banks, right? And, and the projects that I was reading about, right? You have a lot of banks cooperating. Now you need to have, you know, these collaboration agreements or data sharing agreements under GDPR. You're going to have, you know, Article 28s or Article 26s with joint controllers and things like that. Um, so I see the problem is basically twofold. Number one, if the information is anonymized, is it really anonymized? And what are the precautions or the safety or the stops that you can impose for it to not be re-identified? Um, if it's personal information, the easy and the, and the value add that's clear to everybody is that this you know, PETs provide a way to share information in a way that gets you compliant or closer to compliant or much more chance of being compliant with the Article 32 requirement of adequate measures for making the sharing, right, um, safe. I mean, there I've read stories where, you know, not to mention when and where, right, but the sharing itself being done for the, and the money laundering, you know, the focus on how the sharing was done, um, was it done safely, was it done in an email, was it done in a file that wasn't encrypted, right, like that wasn't a focus. So this clearly is, you know, an undisputed value add. The gray area is not how you share, but whether you share. And that part is needs some work because on the one hand, you have right the sort of moral and legal imperative and AML and the directive and the implementing legislation, right? But on the other hand, you have the GDPR concepts of 
you know, how much are you sharing? Do you really need to share all of these, you know, 10 things or are like six and a half enough? And can you like, you know, make up the other ones and can you, you know, meditate and like, you know, do hypnosis and you can get the other three without data sharing, right? So those, those are the, the three issues that I see. Really interesting. So, you, you know, there are um, uh, various uh, characteristics of information sharing, which would bring it outside of scope of, of GDPR. And, you know, we already heard about uh, the, the company data approach that um, some projects have, have started with. And then anonymization, um, obviously, would, would, if it's fulfilled, uh, uh, would, would bring it out outside of scope of uh, GDPR. But as you say, there's a lack of definition about what anonymization um, you know, means, lack of consistency across GDPR uh, uh, jurisdictions. And then when there is a lawful uh, basis, um, you're describing that uh, benefit uh, that uh, these new forms of encryption, these new forms of privacy enhancing technology could provide to raise the bar of uh, the standards um, of, of, of safe uh, 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 governance and, and, uh, and secure processing of, of information, very much speaking to the principles of, of, of GDPR in terms of data minimization. Uh, Etc. Um, I think we'll come back to some of these sticky uh, uh, legal questions uh, as we go through the discussion. But what I, what I want to do is to get a sense of the future, um, where these projects see um, themselves uh, going forward in the next three years. How big is that ambition um, in terms of sharing, uh, both the, the nature of the sharing, uh, the volume of the sharing, the number of participants, perhaps even the geographies. Um, Ronan, from, from your perspective, could you talk us through you know, how you see um, your project uh, growing over the next three years. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, I think there are maybe three points that I'd like to uh, share around where this project is going. Um, so first, of course, we hope to see the network of participants expand, and we're actively working to build it with our current partners. Um, we actually participated in the FCA tech sprint, I think, you know, summer of 2019, and I think they stated it really well, uh, that it, it takes a network to beat a network. So the more institutions that are willing and able to join, the more powerful uh, these types of collaborative investigations become that we're working on. And I'm sure that, that Hilko and Anthony would agree uh, for the projects that they're working on as well. So that's first. Second uh, comes uh, to the data. So we're going to be working with our partners to evaluate new information sharing opportunities that might be difficult to do under GDPR and other privacy regimes. Uh, and help them use homomorphic encryption to solve for that. So as an example in the UK, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is sharing pre-suspicion information for the purposes of uh, fighting fraud, as an example. Um, and then as a part of that, we're also going to work to identify information sharing opportunities that might actually be possible to do under GDPR today, as is, uh, as well as other current privacy regimes, but are still avoided by uh, financial institutions because of the sensitivity of the data. Uh, so as an example, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in being able to share uh, data on victims of data breaches or victims of identity theft, which is really, really sensitive information, but of course uh, is really crucial, integral to helping prevent, detect and investigate different types of cybercrime, fraud, um, you know, even potentially money laundering. Um, so those are really the, the, the three areas where, where I see our projects going. Fantastic. And, and Hilko, you, you know, you've mentioned this, uh, this wait for legislation, but could you talk us through, you know, what that next three years ideally looks like for TMNL, um, you know, assuming the legislation comes through? Sure. Yeah. So I think, and you mentioned this already, uh, Nick, uh, the general promise of a utility is that you can detect financial crime in shared data that is not observable in, uh, in isolated data sets. And that's what we, uh, we call the higher outcome effectiveness, a better uh, detection of financial crime. And I think that has been proven in, in proof of concepts uh, in NL, but also looked upon uh, elsewhere. And the current phase for Team NL after a proof of concept is to build a sound organization, an IT platform, processes and governance around this, and, and proves that that promise also might hold that scale. Huh? And uh, we have a step by step roadmap. Uh, it might even take more than uh, three years, uh, who knows? But in the end, this, this form of utility could be a real game changer to current AML frameworks. Because I think we all know the challenges and imperfections in the, in, in the current uh, framework in terms of impact, what crime is really being uh, detected and also being uh, prosecuted. 
And my personal hope is uh, that in three years in the Netherlands, but, but uh, perhaps also in other uh, countries, um, we will prove that the ambient utilities can remove parts of these challenges by, by, by sharing data in a responsible way and increase the outcome effectiveness. And in, in that, that way, help to reform the AML framework as we know them uh, today, and in a way make the world a, a safer place. It's a big promise, I know, but uh, that's, uh, that's where we're aiming for it. No, fantastic. And I think in, in financial crime, if we're not all trying to reach that, that, that better outcome, then we're, then we're not uh, spending our time well. So, um, you know, fantastic to see that ambition from TMNL. Uh, Anthony, um, obviously you've, you've run, uh, you know, a few use cases, you know, where do you see Project Danny going over the next three years? Sure. So, I mean, thanks to the scalability of the confidential computing that Secretariat uh, provide, we need to think Danny as a platform where you can add several applications. Data quality benchmark is the first application. The AML KYC reconciliation engine is being built. And we are working on a new application for AML CTF, as well as market data benchmark, as this new technology is open to many opportunities. So over the next three years, we can say we expect to have more financial institutions to join Danny so that we can get more overlaps and the collaboration will be more efficient. And once Ethereum developed the technical solution, the group uses the expertise of Element 22 to standardize the data with the challenging goal of keeping the reconciliation while matching requirements of all participants. Great, uh, fantastic. And perhaps before we close, it might be interesting to, you know, uh, hear from, from you all where you see, uh, you know, the next countries perhaps uh, uh, taking on uh, you know, this, this type of opportunity, um, uh, you know, with, within Europe. Um, in terms of the um, kind of key challenges uh, from a policy or, or supervisory perspective uh, when it comes to data protection and the growth of your project, Hilco, perhaps yours is, a, is the clearest, uh, you know, example where you're waiting for, you know, a, a very clear set of, of policy changes. Um, perhaps you can just define, you know, what exactly you're looking for from policymakers and what you'd also like to see from uh, data supervisors to help support that ambition of TMNL. Yeah, sure. See, I'm building on what Odia also said before, I think uncertainty or conflicts perhaps uh, between legislations, that's a key challenge, right? Um, and in, in, in the Netherlands, we see that we move beyond, so that's good, but it might also, also block innovation. And, and with all parties to, to actually develop good solutions. Uh, and, and I think it's good to, to remove that type of uh, challenges. And in the Netherlands, we see that it's uh, on its way, like we uh, talked before, and create more transparency and uncertainty for uh, all uh, actors, and I think that's good. But on the other hand, we also need to be a little bit realistic, perhaps. Uh, legislation is um, not the holy grail, not the only thing that we need to, 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 to solve the tension between data privacy on the one hand and fighting and financial crime on the other hand. So it's not only a legal game, I would say, and yeah? more, more needs to happen. And perhaps to turn that also into a, a, a positive note, what I, what I experience in practice is that it is perhaps, especially because of that uncertainty, because of perceptions that things might not be allowed or that's at least a very complex uh, discussion, that we see the rise of pets. Uh, they also pushed forward because of that uh, uncertainty and to be on the on the safe side in multiple uh, ways. And in, in, in that way, uh, it might help to find an ethical balance rather than only a legal balance only. So if I take that challenge into an optimistic uh, one, you can say uncertainty to be, be removed uh, is, is definitely something supervisors or legislators need to look at. But on the other hand, we need to continue to sharpen our thinking and to, to, to boost developments of, of clever privacy and on technology, let's say. So sharpen the thinking on the technology, but also build that debate around, you know, what is the ethical use of, of data for a policy objective such as fighting financial crime to, you know, win the argument at that higher level. That's 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 very interesting. Um, Ronan, from your perspective, what, what are you looking for from uh, supervisors, particularly data protection supervisors, um, over the next uh, three years or so to, to kind of support that vision that you set out? Sure. Uh, I, I honestly think that Odia and Hilco really hit the nail on the head for this one. Um, you know, financial crime 
laws weren't really built with privacy in account and privacy laws weren't built with financial crime into in account right um so you know i, I think they really did a great job addressing the the conflict or, or competing requirements here right and, and, and the gray area right uh so the market uh, to that end is really asking for clarity on what specific information can be shared under what circumstances and how in terms of processes technology and so on and i i, th I think that's already been covered um, I think Hilco brings up a really good point that, you know, we should think not necessarily just of a legal balance, but of the ethical balance and also the right, the right balance for your business, right? Um, where, you know, what are the technologies and what's the level of risk that you're willing to take in the face of these laws and, and, and of what you're trying to accomplish with your business? Um, you know, there's a lot to balance here. It's not simply a financial crime law versus a privacy law, right? There's, there's a lot to think about. Um, but you know, in terms of public agencies, it would go a very long way to, to be a bit clearer about the type of data that could be used, when it can be used, how, and so on and so forth. That would clear up a, a pretty big hurdle. Great, and, and, and Anthony, what's been your experience so far with, with uh, Project Danny and uh, you know, the kind of interest and engagement you've had from uh, supervisors, AML, you know, and data protection, and, and what would you like to see in, in the future um, to help support the ambition of the project? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, definitely on the our side for the moment, we are, our first use case, can say, is focused on entity data benchmark. And we have uh, excluded all the data attributes uh, linking to individual for the moment. So therefore we don't have to comply with, I mean, GD GDPR regulation, but we plan to add them and uh, our second use case, I mean, the AML KYC, I just mentioned, will also require use to solve the GDPR problem. And the current position of the group is that each participant will need to comply with the GDPR and other data protection regulation. And they may lead to some delay as uh, we may have some several meetings with legal and compliance experts. And I think we also will need to have a discussion with regulators and all the, I mean, regulatory department to make sure that what we have, uh, what we plan to do is on, in the correct uh, way. Great. And, and Odia, you know, listening to those um, challenges or hopes uh, from, uh, you know, what uh, public agencies or supervisors could do, which would make it easier for pra practitioners, you know, how do you think um, uh, data protection supervisors, but also policymakers um, should be, uh, you know, preparing or, or thinking about the relevance of this technology um, so that there's a greater, you know, balance, a more supportive environment, uh, both for data privacy and for uh, information sharing for financial crime in the future. I think that there's a number of things that can be done. The first thing that, it, and it sort of, you know, depend from the easiest to the more difficult, right? The easiest thing that regulators can do is use their um, you know, regulatory or prosecutorial, you know, um, discretion in how to enforce, what to enforce, and to what degree to impose fines. And I think some have already done that in that if a violation stems from an innovative technology, you know, be mindful of the fine because with the understanding that there's an issue and this is sort of the lesser evil than you know, the, the just letting, just not doing it, right? So that one is sort of discre discretion in enforcement, not, you know, not enforcing, but kind of modulating it. That's number one. Number two is clarity, right? Um, and this is an issue that we have still under GDPR, but definitely under CCPA because it's brand new. Um, and this may change now with the new, U, the California-based data protection authority that is Try, that is tasked with giving clarity. But so clarity with respect to, you know, the scope of sharing, what could be a legitimate interest in this context? What constitutes necessity? Um, in the context of CCPA, I didn't mention, but there's sort of lurking the concept of sale and whether or not this sharing is a sale and the scope of the fraud exemption that's in the regulations and kind of went through a number of iterations. So clarity in that clarity is going to be helpful, right? The third piece, which mostly for GDPR is, and I think Hilko mentioned this already, 
is in GD GDPR gives a tool of um, handling this through legal instruments that provide the compliance with law legal basis, right? So if you have state, if you have a specific state law enabling, that resolves some of the problem. And then number four, I think um, I, have, I have five, but number four is going to be you know collaboration between the different regulators, both kind of Europe wide because you don't want to run into or or stay in a situation where you have different approaches like you know um, cough we have with cookies for example right so you would want to have harmonization the other is you want to have some sort of collaboration between the data protection um, regulators and the financial regulators right they can you know hash this out and figure it out and finally one other tool that GDPR allows, um, and has been now, there's been some guidance on it also is a code of conduct, right? So you could formulate some sort of code of conduct that, you know, delineates under what circumstances this sharing can be done in a manner that's compliant with GDPR, and then provided that you fall within those parameters and are able to demonstrate it in accountability, then it would be legal. Really, really interesting. And I think that um, that point around, uh, uh, data protection agencies collaborating. Um, you know, we've we've uh, we have a framework within the financial crime regime through the Financial Action Task Force to bring policymakers, supervisors together um, uh, three times a year uh, through through the FATF plenaries um, and go through you know an international uh, process um, which is you know intended to achieve more consistent uh, approaches and, and raise standards. Um, you know, I wonder whether they're you know, can be more uh, that's done to bring together data protection agencies themselves, but also with uh, that um, that community focused on financial crime. I know the FATF are very interested in doing that, and and uh, I believe the German presidency is hoping to achieve uh, some of that uh, under the presidency of uh, Dr. Marcus Player this year. So we're very excited about that. Um, Thinking, um, you know, your projects that, that we've been talking about have been mostly uh, national. Um, in scope, Hilko and Ronan, you mentioned this kind of uh, concept of it takes a network to to beat a network, and you know the criminals are operating very well across multiple institutions, but they're also working well across borders. And it, it strikes me that we're we're at this stage now where we're trying to solve that first layer of problem, um, how how the uh, response from regulated entities can work better across institutions, but obviously still um, challenged with regard to cross cross border information sharing. Where do you see, you know, Europe in particular, the EU um, uh, states, um, you know, where would you like to see information sharing uh, get to uh, uh, continent wide or, or EU wide? Um, and how do you think privacy enhancing technology could assist uh, in, in that uh, effort? Um, Ronan, if we could start with you. Sure. Um, so, you know, ultimately, at least the way that we see it, you know, a, a financial institution is always looking to get a better view of their risk and their risk profile. Um, and today, a typical financial institution might only be able to see like 15 to 25 percent of its own customers' transactions in their walls, uh, which of course hampers their ability to fight financial crime, do AML, counterterrorism financing effectively. So they want to grow that number. So. You know, to that end, uh, you know, the focus we see for privacy enhancing technologies today is really on one specific piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, we're focusing on investigations, Hilco is focused on transaction monitoring and so on. But, um, you know, we really see it spreading across the financial crime and compliance life cycle, uh, aiding in KYC. I think that, you know, Anthony was, was talking about the direction for his project for that. Thresholding and testing um, and, and transaction monitoring, of course. Um, one thing that we're working on to sort of give you a view for where this could go is we're actually working with DARPA, uh, which is the innovation wing of the US DOD, to develop a capability for training machine learning models on encrypted data. So we see this as having potential, a uh, huge potential opportunity as well. Uh, think of the potential to pool encrypted data from not only multiple institutions, but across multiple jurisdictions, uh, and even internally in financial institutions across multiple jurisdictions, which is difficult today, uh, all encrypted, and then train a machine learning model on top of that, and then analyze all that data holistically, right? Think of what you might be able to uncover while still preserving privacy and confidentiality throughout. Um, so, you know, even projects like this are definitely less than five years away, right? Significantly less. 
Um, and so that's really where I see not only the industry moving to basically building an industry-wide view of risk, um, but also where I see privacy technology moving, basically supporting uh, as a platform, all of these types of activities, not just being point solutions. But fantastic. And, and the same thought to you, Hilko, do you, do you see a transaction monitoring Europe uh, one day or where do you see the next transaction monitoring approach uh, hopefully, hopefully emerging? Yeah, there will be a complicated uh, Nick, not only from a legal perspective, uh, but also from an operational perspective. And I guess building a nationwide, industry-wide utility uh, is already quite a complex uh, uh, project, I can tell, uh, out of experience also. Um, on the other hand, you're right in stating that many friends of crime products are international. Uh, so much focusing on the role of financial institutions as gatekeepers as the first part in the financial crime chain there could be a potential for a use case uh, Europe-wide focusing on the end. So that is where you see public-private uh, partnerships, of course, uh, come to play. We see several use cases also operating uh, in internationally. And in my, in, in my view, if you can combine that, uh, a, a public uh, a European network that's already uh, um, in place with a private partnership, uh, uh, then analyzing on a national level, kind of intelligence-led approach, which uh, a prosecutor starts certain research that are then being followed by uh, financial institutions could be a possibility rather than building a detection oriented uh, utility uh, bottom up uh, which will which will be a very uh, uh, complicated project for yes fantastic and, and and anthony kind of you know looking forward um do, do you see the opportunity to you know build out what you've done in the uk to, to other jurisdictions in in europe Mm, on my side, yeah, for privacy enhancing technology, the best one, uh, by allowing data sharing would uh, allow each actor to speed up their investigation, refine quality of their suspicious activity report, the SAR one, and reduce false positive in order to be more efficient within MLCTF framework. And this way, as mentioned, Ronan, we can create a network between banks where each bank can share data on clients' transaction in real time without revealing sensitive data and become much more efficient in detecting and preventing money laundering scheme. Initiative exists in the world, and uh, I mean, you already see three here. I mean, TMNL, Danny, and Ronan One. And Nick, on your side, you have published a discussion paper on the case studies of the use of privacy preserving analysis to tackle financial crime, where you can see many other initiatives. In a world where data security and privacy is a priority, PETS allowing us to collaborate directly with our peers will improve overall efficiency and reduce management costs for many use cases in the financial world and AML CTF is part of it. So in the next five years, many initiatives will, uh, will definitely uh, emerge based on this disruptive technology, which is privacy enhancing technology. Thank you. And, and, and Odia, um, you know, what is the next five years, you know, where do you see it going in both in terms of the evolution of, um, you know, projects, uh, but, you know, more from your perspective, the evolution of law, uh, to take to take account of uh, the growth of, of this type of in encryption, this type of privacy preserving capability, which perhaps wasn't, you know, in the minds of, uh, of lawmakers when they were first thinking, certainly about uh, the, the, the financial crime uh, legal regime, but also the data protection one. And also, you know, in the US, how do you see the privacy legislation uh, growing? Obviously, we've got the California example, but do you see that as a trend that, um, you know, eventually might uh, take a federal um, uh, 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 statute uh, approach in the US or, or certainly grow beyond California? Um, you know, what do you think's uh, likely uh, in the next five years? Okay, so a couple of things. One, I want to pick up on a couple of things that, that the gentleman said here. So first of all, machine learning, right? Like machine learning and GDPR, you can, you know, your eyes can just like leave your head for a little bit because that is a very complicated problem that um, people are trying to solve with the understanding that you know, um, that th it's a problem, right? That GDPR, like trying to deal with it. And there was a guidance by the ICO recently. And basically it was like, you know, oh, you've mixed, you know, all of the stuff in your batter and now it's a batter, but you still need to pull it out because it's still identifiable and, you know, you need to comply and, and good luck, right? So so machine learning is is one of the things that is, is you know, it's, it's a, 
super helpful aspect in so many things, including in this in, in this area. And you know, the legal issues, you know, there needs to be some sort of solution for it. The other is, you know, I can't, you know, since July, I can't do a, a, any webinar without saying Shrems too, right? So, you know, the cross-border transfer bits that that you were mentioning. Um, collaboration, cross-border collaboration, right, is very important. And it's especially important in this situation because financial crime doesn't, isn't generally localized, right, and does take advantage of the global nature of things. And so um, the cross-border transfers um, from Europe to, you know, so-called third countries, of which the U.S. is, you know, infamously one, um, is, is a problem, right? And even using third, um, even using vendors, right, service providers um, that are based outside of the EU in order to facilitate these types of technologies also creates an issue. So this is obviously the, the Schrems 2 issue is now being discussed. There is draft guidelines by the EDBB. Um, and and that that's, you know, those are two issues that are issues and need to be resolved. I, I hope that you know, as, as I said, I mean, I hope that, you know, over the next five years, um, you know, regulators will be able to be more pragmatic and, you know, figure out a solution that enables this. I mean, regulators across the board, including in this context, based on the, the research that I did, right, they're all saying, oh, privacy shouldn't block you know, AMF, right? And and we were talking about now with COVID privacy shouldn't, you know, um, uh, prevent, you know, COVID testing, right? But it's a matter of balance. And I'm hoping that, you know, the, with the need um, being critical as it is, regulators will find a way to figure out, a, uh, you know, some sort of middle ground that, you know, enables this type of data sharing and leverages technologies that, you know, by definition, reduce the risk, but find a way where the risk is reduced enough, you know, with the under the auspices of, you know, legal instruments in order to be, you know, viable in order to be, you know, good enough for financial institutions to want to take the risk, right? Because a, a, a GDPR data breach, 4% of worldwide revenue, right? That's kind of a big, you know, um, stick to, you know, try something innovative, right? Like I'm going to, otherwise I'll just do AML with my spreadsheet and my, you know, pencil that I sharpen, you know, with my sharpener, right? Um, so that's the, the second concept. Now in the U.S., CCPA and now CPRA, which was passed and is going to come into effect in 2023, um, that set at least set a benchmark, if not from a legal perspective, even though kind of also is because California is a huge, you know, percent of the economy, a lot of companies are active in California, even though they are not physically present there. So it set a benchmark in, in the law, but also in the perception of people with respect to information, with respect to their rights. Um, it definitely is starting a cascade of something. Now, the something is right now states, um, Washington, um, there are a, a number of other states that have started. There's Texas, Arizona, there are some states that are sort of, you know, looking into um, having a state law. Um, fortunately or not fortunately, um, they are not CCPA clones. And so we're going to uh, probably inevitably have a situation where you have laws that are not exactly the same and require adaptation from industry, um, which creates obviously some, you know, a burden uncertainty. Um, federal law is a complicated question. On the one hand, with the new administration, um, following, you know, the increased awareness with COVID um, and the CCPA and the state laws, there is a bigger push than has ever been to do something privacy, to, to have a federal privacy law, right? There is a push. The, the issue with respect to timing is that um, there, there are very, the two parties in the US, right? They are divided with respect to a number of key points, which actually are not, you know, privacy principles, right? The, 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 the differing thing is not like, ooh, transparency or choice or control. No, they're sort of meta aspects, which are, um, private right of action, should people be able to sue or not? 
who is the um, authority enforcing it? Should it be the FTC? Should it not be the FTC? What authority should the FTC have that it doesn't not already have? And number three, um, uh, should a federal law be a threshold or a ceiling, right? The preemption question. And those are three critical items that the two parties have not been able to breach even when a COVID specific privacy law was on the table, which, you know, I mean, obviously now it looks like this is gonna be here forever, but we know it's sort of a matter of it's temporary. So even with respect to a temporary time limited issue, a law was not able to be passed because of those three issues. So that sort of leaves me a little bit skeptical as to the timeline of a federal law, but I am hopeful that there, at least with respect to the aspects that um, deal with or facilitate the cross-border transfers, maybe like tweaks regarding the surveillance law or recourse in order to facilitate the SHREMS 2 issue, I'm hoping that that we will see in the imminent future because like we need a solution for that. Thank you, That that's really interesting to give us a sense of those, those uh, you know, mega trends, uh, not just in Europe, but in, in the US, it, you know, it, it does, does strike me as a, you know, a strange situation where the, the US is so um, uh, focused in political debates about, you know, individual uh, uh, rights and, and, and liberties, but yet Americans don't have that same control over their uh, data that, um, you know, perhaps European counterparts do. Um, so this trend and the, and the importance of uh, financial crime and the importance of a, you know, a joined up debate uh, between the two as they move forward, cognizance of the technology, uh, I think is going to be uh, really important uh, in the five years, you know, moving forward. Um, we're going to close out the panel now uh, with just um, uh, one word from each panelist, um, and it's a, a kind of top recommendation. Uh, some of our viewers will be policymakers. Uh, some of our viewers will be um, practitioners in, in financial uh, institutions or regulated entities. Some will be from law enforcement, perhaps. Um, so you pick, you know, who your recommendation is is for. But you know, for uh, to to take this debate forward, you know, what do you think are the, are the uh, is the top takeaway uh, that you would like to you know leave the viewers with um, today? Uh, Ronan, if I can go to you. Sure. Uh, so I'll leave you with two words, not not just one. Sorry. Uh, so first, I, you know, I think communication is absolutely crucial. Uh, communicate with your other industry peers about your challenges and communicate with the appropriate public agencies about your challenges. Uh, they need to hear your questions. They need to hear your concerns so that they can address them. Uh, hearing it from us is nice, but hearing it from the industry itself is much better. Uh, so that's first. Uh, and second, and I think uh, Odia uh, alluded to this point, um, I would really encourage everyone to innovate and to experiment. Uh, we can only improve if we try new things. We can only improve if we're working together. Uh, we can only improve if we have this sort of culture of trying new things. Um, and, you know, of course, that will bring up new questions, new concerns, new challenges, but we'll address them as we go along. Otherwise, we, we can't progress without it. So that, that would be my, uh, my call to action, if you will. Fantastic. And Anthony, uh, what would be your call to action? Yeah, I think I joined to tell you, Ronan, on what you say about communication. And the other part also is collaboration, as you mentioned. It's becoming really a new paradigm, we can say. And it revolutionized, I mean, the way risk model and decision-making process are designed. And we know that financial institutions should acknowledge the value of their, can, they can harness from the data they share between them. And maybe one of uh, the, the good things uh, I've read on uh, the world of forum economics, it's uh, on the discussion paper talking about uh, the next generation of data sharing in financial services using privacy enhancing techniques to unlock new value. It says that collaborative data sharing allows institutions to achieve a skill of data that they would not be able to reach on their own, unlocking a depth and breadth of insight that would otherwise not be possible. So it's really something that really uh, sum up and resume why I mean all the financial institutions and also uh, uh, regulators and uh, let's say uh, all the data regulator need to think of and really innovation it's something that all together we'll be able to make and we can see that many use cases that we have on financial institution can be solved thanks to these uh, technologies and the support. Fantastic and and Odia your, your top uh, takeaway? So I'm gonna, you know, keep with the alliteration here so Renan said um, uh, communication, Anthony said uh, collaboration. I'm going to go with clarity. 
I think that um, regulators, it, it would be really helpful for everybody if we got more clarity from regulators about, you know, um, legal basis, legitimate interest, scope of necessity, um, the def definition of anonymization and de-identification, um, scope of sale, um, the fraud exemption under CCPA, right? Like getting parameters from regulators that business can work with because that sort of, you know, is, is sort of a condition precedent to operating, right? Like you can be, you know, innovative and I mean, I'm, I'm married to an entrepreneur. I know, I, I see how his mind works, right? He's like all these ideas and it's like, Nah, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Well, at least if you know what you can and can't do, then, you know, there's something to talk about. So I would go with clarity. Great. Hilko, a bit of a, a subtle challenge for you, not only to have a recommendation, but also to follow the theme of um, uh, the alliteration. Uh, over to you. Yeah, your panelists are quite well aligned today, uh, Nick, and so am I. I would go make conversation and, and build trust. And as a, as, a, as a data guy, initially, I will admit I uh, thought of GDPR as uh, being restrictive or perhaps at least complicating. But actually, I came to embrace it as a, as a process and a process in which you are forced to uh, think and speak about why you're sharing data and what conditions and what the consequences are. And that's, I think, for a very good reason. Um, so that's what we have to do. We have to follow a good process. Uh, we're in times of rapid development and technology legislation will develop fast, iteratively. So I think it's only when uh, stakeholders act open-minded, follow innovations, have a good debate about um, uh, privacy and financial crime, we can drive that development in the, in, in the right direction. And um, I hope we make a, a small step in that uh, today as well with this webinar. So thanks for that. Fantastic. Excellent. So uh, communication, collaboration, clarity, and, and continuing that conversation uh, to, to, to help um, support understanding of, of, of this uh, debate. Uh, from our part, we'll continue that with uh, the, the RUSI Future of Financial Intelligence Sharing Research uh, project on privacy preserving analysis and the role in uh, tackling financial crime. Um, we've got a number of papers out in 2021, so please do stay tuned for that. We'll be working with uh, 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 the, the, the stakeholders on, on this panel, and it's been a pleasure to uh, speak with them today. Uh, Catherine, I'll hand over to you to, to close us out. Great. So this has been an excellent conversation. Um, we'd like to thank all of you on behalf of Reality. You've shared so many interesting and practical insights on how effectively financial institutions can balance competing and sometimes conflicting compliance requirements, uh, how they can collaborate, how they can share financial intelligence, which is so crucial to fighting financial crime. Again, I would like to run, remind the audience, if you have any questions or comments, please send them to us to info at dualitytech.com. That's it. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.